All right. This is Patrick Field, and I think what we'll do is, is get started with our webinar. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. Uh, this is sponsored by NYSERDA, as you know, uh, for sharing about uh, one of two of the offshore wind developers that was recently awarded a procurement by the state of New York. Uh, and the webinar was primarily intended for um, commercial fishermen. Um, the hour will include an opening by Greg Lampman of NYSERDA to talk a little bit about the overall process and, and, and New York's energy plan regarding offshore wind and specifically this procurement. Uh, and then the majority of the time will be turned over to Captain John O'Keefe, who will be representing Orsted and the Sunrise Project to talk about the project. And then lastly, we will have time for questions uh, that all of you may pose um, as we go through the session. Um, a few things to note that I'll just talk about the mechanics and we'll get started. Uh, one note, this is uh, relatively early in project development, so there are any number of much more specific site-based questions or issues that will not be answerable yet, so just keep that in mind as you think about your questions. Um, the webinar is recorded so the people who couldn't join today can still watch it and learn and capture both the slides and the, the voiceover, so to speak, and it will be available on the Fisheries Technical Working Group website uh, as well, uh, so people can get hold of it um, in, in coming days and weeks. Okay, the mechanics are pretty straightforward. So we have everybody on mute for sound quality. Uh, this is primarily a listening webinar, um, and we'll try to manage any sort of funky sounds that come up uh, as we go. Um, there is a chat function in the Zoom webinar tool, um, and what you can do is you can go to the chat function, and at any time you can uh, pose a question anytime as people are presenting as you want. That uh, chat will go directly to our, our host or organizer, Maggie, here with me at the Consensus Building Institute, or CBI. She will be collecting those questions and then forwarding them to Greg Lampman. And then uh, at about uh, 40 to 45 minutes into the uh, webinar, uh, as John finishes his presentation, Greg will begin to go through those and ask those questions of John, and, and John will respond. And then we will end just shortly before 3 o'clock, only because we have another webinar for the other developer very soon will be happening at three. So we'll, we'll sign off just before three o'clock. Okay, with that, I'm gonna really turn it over to Greg to uh, get us going. We have slides up on the webinar for those who are watching via computer. And Greg and John both will just kind of let us know to move the slides through, which we are most anxious to, to manage uh, uh, visual control. All right, Greg, over to you. Thanks, Pat, I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Lampman. I manage NYSERDA's environmental research program, and I've been engaged in, uh, in offshore wind here at NYSERDA since the inception of the Offshore Wind Master Plan. My role has been predominantly around issues in the offshore space, particularly as it relates to, uh, to wildlife, commercial fishing, and, and things of that nature. Uh, next slide, please. We want to give you a, uh, a brief orientation to some of the activities that NYSERDA has been undertaking in the space as it pertains to commercial fishing specifically. I'll talk a little bit about our procurement process, and then again, as Pat, as that Pat mentioned, we'll be turning it over to the uh, Sunrise Wind team to talk specifically about their project and the activities they'll be undertaking, again, with a focus on commercial fishing. Get the, and uh, we'll end that with, uh, with a Q&A, and again, you can, uh, you can submit questions via the chat function at the bottom of the page. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're, we're pretty excited about is uh, last month, NYSERDA deployed two Met Ocean buoys into the locations uh, identified on the map here. These are within Boehm's draft wind energy areas. Those Met Ocean buoys are designed to collect qualified wind speed and oceanographic data per international standards. But in addition to collecting that wind speed data, we are also collecting information about wildlife. Uh, so those buoys are equipped with sensors that will collect uh, acoustic data for birds and bats, as well as passive acoustic monitoring for marine mammals. We also have uh, uh, detectors for, to, do, uh, to detect tagged fish. So uh, thinking about tagged fish in the space like, uh, like Atlantic sturgeon and so forth. So given their location and the distance from shore, we think this is going to be a really great platform for collecting new environmental data out there. Um, and later this week, we'll be making that information or a link to that data available on the NYSERDA Offshore Wind webpage so that you can access that information that's being hosted in virtual real time by DNVGL and Normando, respectively, for the Met Ocean and the wildlife data. Um, these are going to be deployed for a period of two years in those locations. And again, data is going to flow continuously um, from a Met Ocean perspective, and the wildlife data will be updated every six months as that data is being housed on board the buoys themselves. Next slide, please. 
We're also wrapping up a three-year survey, uh, three-year digital aerial survey over the New York Bite. Uh, that that uh, final survey was conducted this spring, and the data is being analyzed now, and the identified organisms are being uh, ID'd and, and QAQC'd. We collected a lot of information about macroorganisms, as you see here, a, a, a ray and a sea turtle, but we also additionally have been collecting information uh, as it relates to fish shoals where we, where we visualize them. So that information is also being made available. Again, you can, you can access this information via the Normando remote website. A link to that data is available on the NYSERDA offshore wind page now. Um, but the course of that survey, we collected more than three and a half million images over the space. And uh, on, that, on the website, the Normando website, there is uh, the ability to, to look at maps and look at the distribution seasonally of all these different species. Uh, the nice thing about digital aerial surveys are they're, they're, they're collected at a flight height where we're able to go back in and refly those surveys post construction and see how the distribution of wildlife happens or how, how the distribution of wildlife may have changed following development of offshore wind. Next slide, please. We're also very excited to announce two new projects that we're in contracting um, now for. Uh, the first one relates to understanding what constrains fishing access within a turbine array. Uh, that project is being led by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, with support from Rhoda and others. But the intention here is to understand what constrains fishing access to a turbine array and what can we do to try to minimize those constraints. Again, our goal here is to seek uh, co, uh, um, co use of the space uh, as much as is possible. The other project is to try to develop a fisherman's data trust. So we've heard through the master planning process and other activities that fishermen have a great deal of data that would be a value to, value to the decision-making process, both at the state and federal levels. But the, the access to that data is limited, and our intention here is to come up with a way in which that data can be provided, but the confidentiality can be protected. And in, and in doing so, be able to make the data available in appropriate form for decision making, both at the state and federal levels. Again, that project is being led, a uh, primary contractor is the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, or RODA, and uh, we're working on contracting that now and, and getting that in place. Next slide, please. So that's some of the things that we've, we've got in the works now currently in the offshore space. Um, when it comes to conversations and communications with the fishing industry, our primary conduit for that has been our Commercial Fishing Technical Working Group, or our F-TWIG. This is a, a depiction of the configuration of the F-TWIG. On the top left, you see the key stakeholders, the fishing industry representatives who are part of the F-TWIG, and on the top right are the developers holding leases in the space. Um, the idea, we, we, we think of those two groups as our core, or the F-TWIG core members. Um, and the intention is to facilitate conversations between the fishing industry and the developers through this forum. And through those conversations, the agencies and the regional state agencies, the federal agencies and the regional state agencies in the lower half of the figure uh, can learn from those conversations and support those conversations. So again, it's a forum for conversation and communication. And in some cases, these groups identify things that they think the state should be doing to try to advance responsible development of offshore wind. And so we try to take the feedback provided by the F-TWIG and put it into action through a series of activities that are supported by our technical and facilitation support team that is, uh, that is involved with the project process as well. Um, so if you're interested in, in providing input into uh, decision-making by the state, this is a great conduit. You can use these organizations as representatives and reach out to them. Um, so we're working on both what I would describe as spatially agnostic topics. So the fishing access, as we discussed, is, is one of those examples. But we'll also be using the F-TWIG for site-specific projects. So working directly with uh, Sunrise Wind, for example, to try to make sure that they're hearing the concerns of the fishing community and considering that in their decision making, as well as the state uh, hearing those conversations, considering it in our decision making. Next slide, please. So just to highlight again some of these things, one of, one of the things that uh, the FTWIG has identified as, a, as an activity they like to pursue is developing best management practices or best management principles that could be considered for inclusion in a state procurement for renewable energy. So things that we could include in our contracts perhaps uh, that would require developers to do certain things. 
Um, so we're starting those conversations now with, uh, with the FTWIG and trying to develop something that uh, would be acceptable to all the members of the TWIG and that we could advance to the Public Service Commission for consideration and procurements. Um, again, a couple of the projects that the group identified as important have been now funded through one of our competitive solicitations. Again, as I mentioned, the Fishing Access Study and the Fisherman's Data Trust. Uh, another topic that the group felt was pretty important was uh, development of transit lanes in the New York Bight with the intention of trying to understand how fishermen use the space so that we can inform BOEM so that they can use that information in consideration of how they lay out future lease areas in the New York Bight. Um, we started that process about a year ago, uh, culminated in a workshop, and we're trying to move forward a bit farther with some greater clarification on that. Uh, a lot of you will be hearing more about that in the, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and then finally, the state is also, uh, in addition to having conversations through the FTWIG and the fishing organizations associated, the state is also in the process of hiring a fisheries liaison to serve much the same role as the liaison does for the developers. Uh, basically, we want to have more one-on-one -on -one interactions with the fishing community, more conversations, learn more of perspectives and needs by, by the fishing community, and also to try to convey to the extent that we can the perspectives and views of the state and the constraints we have on our processes. Again, just really trying to open those lines of communication and, uh, and make sure everyone is as uh, much on the same page as we can. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see this is the, uh, the website for the New York State uh, Fisheries Technical Working Group. And we try to house information about all of these meetings and the topics we're engaged in on that web page. And you're free to access that uh, at any time. Next slide, please. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you may have heard earlier this year, New York State recently passed legislation called the New York Cli um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Embedded within this legislation is a requirement for the state to achieve a 9,000, uh, to, to procure 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. This is a pretty substantial portion of the 100% clean energy by 2040 goal, and in fact accounts for about 30% of the state's electric load. This is a major goal that, uh, that the state has in order, to, uh, in order to achieve its clean energy goals. And uh, actually those goals have, have shifted with this legislation to a mandate. So uh, it's something we're gonna be working very closely on. But again, we're still trying to advance offshore wind in a way that is both cost effective and responsible to ocean users, such as the commercial fishing industry. Next slide, please. A major step in achieving this 9,000 megawatt goal is our first solicitation that was released late in 2018. Uh, we're in the contracting process for those now. Uh, that solicitation elicited uh, 18 bids from four proposers. So each of those proposers gave different versions of proposals that the state could consider. Um, so we had a total of 18 different uh, bids to consider from these four proposers. The evaluation criteria for decision-making around those proposals was based 70% on the overall price of the energy, 20% on the economic benefits afforded New York State through that procurement, and 10% based on project viability. So this is the likelihood of the project succeeding. Included in there were a lot of uh, aspects around permitting and the status of project development, but it also included consideration of fishing mitigation plans and environmental mitigation plans. Next slide, please. One of the things that we wanted to be sure that we included in our procurement was uh, backing up our position of trying to advance offshore wind that is in a way that is both responsible and cost effective. So we included, based on feedback from the public and from the fishing uh, technical working group and the environmental technical working group, a number of considerations that, uh, that were incumbent upon the proposers. Um, the first is the requirement of uh, fisheries and environmental mitigation plans with the proposals. The contents of those mitigation plans or the requirements around those mitigation plans were really vetted well by the fishing technical working group. So it was provided to them in draft form. Uh, they provided a lot of edits on what they thought should be included. And those edits were incorporated in the, in the final procurement. Um, we also included the requirement that the selected developers work with the fishing and environmental technical working groups to evolve those mitigation plans as the project progresses to make sure that, uh, again, this is the one-on-one -on -one interaction between the fishermen and the developers. Uh, we also required consultations between the state agencies and the developers and to make sure that environmental data collected on the sites was transparent. 
just want to pause for a moment and say that you know we've we've tried through this process to be sure that the stakeholders that have been working with the state in developing offshore wind were considered through this process but this does not um, duplicate we don't want to duplicate or replicate the federal process in development of offshore wind so we've really re placed some requirements on the developers that uh, they're going to have to be responsive to from a contractual perspective with us but they need to work with those requirements within the context of the federal process as well so this is not the only way that fishermen will be involved in those individual projects the developers have a lot more responsibilities than this this was just our approach at assuring that the stakeholders we've worked with are engaged in the process and considered in the decision making and also for the state to learn throughout that process next slide please So we selected through that procurement process a total of two projects culminating in a total megawatt procurement of 1,696 megawatts. This is the largest uh, procurement, uh, renewable energy procurement in U.S. history. Um, and it includes two projects, which are really enough to power about one million homes. So it's a, it's a major start. It's almost two gigs of our nine gig goal. So it's a major start in that process uh, coming from these two projects. Next slide, please. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the details, but as, as a package, these two projects include uh, manufacturing in the upstate region um, using some of the ports in the Hudson River. It includes staging and installation in the New York Harbor using a number of ports in, uh, in the New York region, as well as longer term operations and maintenance hubs out of Brooklyn and Port Jefferson. So the two projects are the Empire Wind Project at 1860 megawatts and the Sunrise Wind Project at 1,880 megawatts. And uh, I don't want to get into a lot of details on these because we're going to hear more about them in just a moment. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention as well is that uh, we have a number of public open house meetings coming up. You can get the information about those on NYSERDA's website, but we'll be meeting in Brookhaven on the 17th, Southampton on September 18th, Long Beach on the 19th, the Rockaways on the 23rd, and Sunset Park on September 25th. More information is available on the NYSERDA website. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Captain John O'Keefe, who is the Head of Marine Affairs at uh, uh, Ersted, to talk a little more about, uh, about their specific project. John? Great. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Can, uh, can everyone hear me? Loud and clear here. Okay, great. And while I'm waiting for uh, for for our presentation to to come up here, uh, so a, a little bit about me. Obviously, my name uh, is John O'Keefe uh, from from Orsted U.S. Offshore Wind. Uh, a little bit about me: I, I was uh, in the military for about eight years, worked in long range reconnaissance. Uh, I then sailed globally for about uh, uh, over 15 years. And then uh, what we call came ashore, uh, went to URI, uh, studied marine affairs, and then started to work for Deepwater Wind. Uh, I worked for Deepwater Wind for about three years uh, before the, the merger with Orsted, and now I work for, for Orsted US uh, as the head of marine affairs. In that role, I work with all maritime stakeholders, uh, including commercial recreational fisheries, uh, commercial shipping, uh, US Coast Guard, and, and, and other DOD uh, agencies. Um, I'm also a member of uh, the New York EPTWIG, uh, as well as my colleague Rodney Avila, who is the Orsted Fisheries Liaison. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about the uh, Sunrise Wind uh, Partnership. Uh, this is a 50-50 joint venture uh, project between Orsted and Eversource. Uh, a little bit about Orsted, uh, the offshore wind pioneer. They built the first offshore wind farm in the world, not to mention the first, uh, now the first offshore wind project in the U.S., the Block Island Wind Farm, and developing the largest project portfolio in the country. Uh, the global leadership, 20 plus years of experience uh, building offshore wind farms, and their expertise of uh, uh, 25 successful wind farms totaling uh, over five and a half gigawatts of, of capacity. And then we combine that with uh, Eversource energy leader with over 100 years of history of operations in, in the Northeast uh, in New England's largest energy company and the premier uh, transmission developer. Uh, we think that makes for an excellent partnership uh, 
and, and, a, and a very strong uh, project base. We combine that uh, land sea expertise uh, to deliver. Next slide, please. So Sunrise Wind, the project is 880 megawatts, as Greg said, of clean, reliable energy. Uh, it's located uh, 30 plus miles uh, away from uh, Montauk to the east, and that outport is delivered over a, what will be a new submarine cable to Brookhaven, New York. Uh, that production uh, of energy beginning in 2024 projected, uh, and, that, and that's in line with uh, New York's uh, nation-leading energy mandate, uh, as Greg stated, of, of nine gigawatts. Uh, and that's going to result in, in 800 direct jobs uh, in the neighborhood of over 1,500 indirect jobs. Uh, and those jobs will be, will be high paying wages uh, and, <clears throat> and, and good jobs for Long Island. Next slide, please. So some of that investment uh, that, that I alluded to, these are strategic initiatives uh, for Long Island um, and to help position New York as a as an industry leader in offshore wind. Uh, these include $10 million to fund the National Workforce Training Center, a million dollars for the Upper Hudson Workforce Development Fund, uh, $10 million for New York Ports Infrastructure Development Fund, uh, and then the Port Jefferson Regional Operations and Maintenance Hub. Uh, this one, you know, it, it, I'm very excited about uh, complementary use of the port that, that won't conflict with the ferry service, but will add uh, approximately 100 permanent full-time jobs over the, the life of the project, uh, and also uh, short-term construction jobs. And, and we'll have a uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, operation out of that, out of that facility. Uh, next slide, please. So our commitment to the fishing industry, as, as Orsted Eversource uh, in the Sunrise Project. So th these are some of our key philosophies in, in, in what we will do and what we commit to doing is Promoting the smart growth of the of the offshore wind industry, offshore wind industry here in America, uh, focusing on maintaining access and navigation in and around our wind farms for for everyone, including commercial and recreational fishing. Uh, complete scientific research collaboratively with the fishing communities, and be accessible and available at, at all times. Next slide, please. So these are just a, a snapshot of some environmental and fishing commitments underway. Um, at the Block Island Wind Farm, I think we all, we've all heard it at this point, uh, you know, it is the first offshore wind farm in the U.S. and an excellent uh, platform to conduct uh, research. Uh, comprehensive multi-year research has already been, been done and still underway. Um, some other commitments that we've made and, and are continuing to work with are our partnership with, with Rhoda. Uh, we're very excited about that as well. We're first uh, in the industry to, to partner with them, and we look forward to continuing to work with Rhoda, uh, among others. And extensive engagement with fishermen. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of meetings uh, with fishermen, and, and we hope to continue to, to have those discussions and, and productive discussions and input. Uh, we, and out of those discussions, the reason why I bring it up is the alignment of turbines along east to west rows. That was one of the one of the big issues that came out of some of these discussions already to date. Uh, and, and we've committed to that to that alignment. Uh, and, and those east to west rows will be spaced a nautical mile apart. Uh, as well as extensive marine mammal and fisheries research portfolio with many uh, leading universities. Next slide, please. So this this slide uh, kind of walks through a little bit of a, a rudimentary understanding of how this lease area was identified. The lease area uh, that Sunrise will be located in went through a, a, an incredibly rigorous process over many years, uh, and it was a demonstration of, of really solid ocean planning uh, from our point of view. Uh, you can click forward, Pat, please. Might be a bit of a, there we go, a little bit of a delay, but so this kind of walks through in, in, the, in the larger box uh, was representative of the first area uh, and then the pink areas, it may be tough to see for some folks, but um, were areas that were carved out specifically for different stakeholders and ocean users. Uh, in this instance, some of these areas are, are key fishing areas 
um, that were, were identified and taken out of that lease area. Uh, and obviously there's the, the traffic separation schemes to the west. Uh, but that's just an idea of how this, why this lease area in particular looks the way it does. It did go through a, an extensive uh, uh, process of stakeholder engagement and identifying areas uh, that, would, that were already in use. Next slide, please. So the wind farm location, uh, it is lease uh, 0487. Uh, here is identified the survey area uh, on the nautical chart. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're what we're trying to accomplish uh, and striving to accomplish the following objectives. Our, our number one goal at the end of the day, you know, in terms of working with the commercial fishing industry and the recreational industry, is to keep fishermen fishing. That that is that is always at the top of our minds uh, at Orsted. We we work towards that. It's not always perfect, but that is our goal. Um, we know that that. Offshore wind and, and other ocean users, not just not just the fishing industry, uh, can coexist. We see it happening every day at Block Island, and we also see it at our, at our other projects uh, globally. We're committed to working with the uh, with the industry and and iron out our differences. We we are trying to be good neighbors uh, out there at the end of the day, and engaging with all all users of the ocean early and often, trying to keep folks informed of every, everything that we're doing in, in our activities. Uh, survey, construction, operations, and, and eventually, you know, one, one day decommissioning. Uh, we recognize that there may be impacts, and certainly specifically temporary impacts during the construction phase. We, we will go through extensive construction planning uh, and address uh, with individual fishermen who, uh, who are impacted or may be impacted. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, more on, on the Roto Orsted partnership, uh, the opportunity for commercial fishermen uh, and, and hopefully in the future recreational fishermen to provide direct input to the wind industry, wind energy industry uh, on, 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 on matters that are of, uh, of utmost importance to, to both industries. Next slide, please. So we're, we are committed to our stakeholders, uh, maintain strong working relationships with, with many in the commercial and recreational industry. Um, we believe communication is, is essential, and at the end of the day, communication is always essential no matter, no matter who we're, who we're uh, talking to, whether it's the commercial or, or, or recreational industry or, or the Coast Guard or, or, or other ocean users. Uh, and we recognize that all, not, not all conflicts can be resolved through communications alone. You know, open, honest interaction helps to manage that those conflicts when they come up, and we we work through them and, and try to identify the best ways to avoid or mitigate impacts that may occur or, or are occurring um, from happening again in the future. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a just a high level philosophy of of, of collaborating, uh, cooperating, uh, coordinating, and, and communicating. Next slide, please. So a little, a little bit more on that, on that philosophy is communications. Uh, you know, th that involves uh, hundreds and hundreds of discussions uh, dockside. It includes uh, the FTWIG uh, interactions, obviously, uh, with NYSERDA. And, you know, there, there, there is no one source of communication. It has to be, it has to be at, at many different levels, whether it's on the dock, whether it's, whether it's in an FTWIG, whether it's at a state working group. Uh, whether it's at a fisheries management council meeting, uh, that, that communication is key. Um, coordinating, coordinating during different phases of our projects, uh, including survey activity, construction and operations, uh, input from the fisheries liaisons and the fisheries representatives uh, are really key to help us improve that coordination um, with, with, with fishermen of all gear types. Uh, collaborating on, on solutions to optimize access uh, and, and fishing in and around the wind farm. Uh, we will share research and information uh, that we gathered in our studies that, that maybe have helped to further understand the resource. Uh, and, and we commit to that in, in several ways. And one of those is, that, is the ROSA collaboration that we're, we're continuing to work on. And finally, coexistence. We, we do believe coexistence can happen. We do see it every day. We, we see it at the Block Island Wind Farm. And, and I fully understand that that's a, a small slice of of what we're talking about in the future, but we also see coexistence happening 
in our other projects uh, globally. Uh, next slide, please. So our uh, part of our communications coordination, all all our four C's, really falls into our our outreach outreach team. We believe we've put together one of the best outreach teams uh, in the U.S. currently. It is it is very extensive, and we are continuing to build, as you can see from this slide. Um, so there's obviously my, myself, um, Rodney Avalar, our our Orsted Fisheries liaison. We have Julia Prince, who covers New York and Connecticut. Uh, we have uh, just recently hired Ed LeBlanc, uh, formerly of the U.S. Coast Guard, over 40 years experience with the Coast Guard and working with um, maritime stakeholders, uh, and Caitlin O'Mara, who is our coordinator. And then the representatives who would, do not work for us, um, but are, are parts of, you know, a very key part of how we communicate uh, between the, the fisheries liaisons, the reps of the community, and the individual fishermen. Uh, Julie Evans from, from New York. Uh, we do have another uh, fisheries representative coming on board from New York. That contract is is pending, and will be in, that person will be announced uh, as soon as that contract is finalized. Uh, Sid Holbrook out of Connecticut, uh, Erlingberg out of New Jersey, and then uh, Mass Lobstermen's Association, uh, Martha's Vineyard Fishermen's Preservation Trust, New Bedford Port Authority, uh, and Rodman Sykes uh, from Rhode Island. So as you can see, you know there are some there is room for growth here. Uh, we're always looking to add uh, folks to our team, and if you have uh, if folks on this call or, or that listen to this uh, recording uh, can recommend, you know, folks that are interested in working with us and interested in making sure that we maintain those those critical lines of communication, uh, please reach out uh, and recommend those folks. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is kind of a permitting snapshot. Uh, I, I realize there's a lot of uh, text here, but this is the pro process that informs project design uh, and mitigation measures. Um, but the purpose of this slide is to discuss uh, the fact that we identified a long list of mitigation measures already that we can we can implement in the in the FMP. We first need to perform a lot of assessments um, for state and federal and local agencies in order to identify. Uh, potential impacts that require mitigation. So you can see this is this is busy, but it, it does show uh, our interactions with New York State and with the federal government uh, for the Sunrise Project. Obviously, the F twig, the New York F twig, will be an incredibly valuable tool, um, but it, it, it is it is one tool of many uh, that we'll be using over the uh, to, to develop uh, how we look at the project, what goes into the project, and what mitigations may be necessary. There's obviously other avenues, uh, many avenues for input, and this just gives a high level of what those avenues are. Next slide, please. So many tools to rely on for, for mitigation or, or lessening uh, potential impacts. That includes fisheries monitoring. Um, you, know, you know, ROTA can be a part of that. We, we do strongly believe ROSA uh, can be a part of that with, with regional science. Um, and also build on the, the science and, and fisheries monitoring plans uh, that have happened out of the Block Island wind farm. Uh, we do think there, there can be an opportunity for additional business for fishermen. We, we've hired local fishermen before and we plan to do so in the future. Uh, and we welcome any, any opportunity to develop those opportunities. Uh, as well as the fish, fishery, fishing gear loss prevention and claim procedure. Uh, we were the first developer to come out with that procedure for potential gear loss, how to, how we look to ways to prevent that from happening in the first place. But if it does happen, how do we, how do we mitigate that and how do we, how do we address, uh, claims from, from fishermen? Uh, there's many ways that we do that. We do go to a painstaking process, uh, to try to get as much information out as possible. Um, we have online ways, uh, on our website. We have updates for mariners. We uh, we send out updates up on VHF, uh, and we continue to to look for and listen to new ideas on the best ways to to communicate. Next slide, please. So so back to you know how we communicate and how we're conducting our outreach. Um, we have we have a very extensive document. It is available on the website. I encourage you to go there and look at it. It's our fisheries communication outreach plan uh, that, that goes across all our projects, and we'll, we will be making a project sunrise-specific uh, appendix 
to, to understand that there will be Sunrise specific uh, needs for communication and outreach. Uh, there's our key strategies in there for communicating with folks, uh, making sure they get the information that they need. Uh, there is a back and forth. Uh, that, that plan obviously builds on uh, BOEM's, BOEM's uh, best practices and guidelines. Uh, we, we feel like it goes, it builds on that and it goes beyond it. Uh, we do continue to use our Block Island wind farm experience because it is, it is currently the only operational wind farm in the U.S. Uh, but we're always looking for ways to improve and, 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 and open to new ideas on how to improve. Uh, but th that being said, we do have uh, extensive global experience and relationships uh, from our current operating offshore wind farms around, around the world. Uh, I just visited one uh, two days ago in the UK out at, uh, at Race Bank uh, and saw firsthand uh, some of the ways that we do communicate uh, what a, what a large-scale commercial wind farm looks like uh, working with commercial fisheries, working with other users uh, that are, are moving through the through those uh, operating farms. So for more information on that, please go to the us.orsted.com Mariners page. Um, there's, a, I think, an extensive amount of information on there. Uh, if there was more information that folks would like to see, uh, I encourage you to reach out and let us know. Um, I look forward to, to working together on this project. I look uh, I certainly look forward to working uh, through the New York after week process. I think it's again one of the most valuable tools that we that we do have um, going forward and, and make sure that we get input uh, critical input uh, into the project early and often. With that, I think next slide is my final slide. Yeah, and I just want to thank everyone uh, on, on the call for for showing up on a Friday afternoon. For me right now, it's Friday evening. Um, but I do, I do thank you for listening, and please do feel free to reach out um, at any time. Great. John, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So um, what we're going to do now, um, Greg has some questions, and he will pose those to John. John will uh, answer those, and we'll have a, a little bit of back and forth. So, Greg, I'm going to turn it to you. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, and if anyone on the, on the webinar has any questions, feel free to use the chat function and submit them. But... Um, I had a couple of questions that we wanted to ask that I've heard I've heard fishermen ask um, uh, over the over the last few months and uh, and try to get a response from you. So um, one of the questions that comes up actually is a couple of them around navigation in particular. But uh, what do you guys have in terms of plans around uh, navigational aids within the wind farm to help mariners transit through? Yeah, that's that's a great question and, and one that's uh, again near and dear to my heart as a as a professional mariner. So for, for navigation, you know, obviously it varies country to country. Uh, for the U.S., we, we will follow the international standard, the IALA standards for nav aids. Um, depending on what the, the layout ends up looking like at the end of the day, there are, very, uh, there are some very prescriptive uh, guidance on aids to navigation, and that includes uh, uh, private aids to navigation that will be installed on each, on each platform. Uh, whether it's a, a, a monopile or a, or a substation. Um, and those are private aids navigations, but they are maintained and they are inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, there are other, many other uh, forms of aids navigation. Uh, one key one right now is, is uh, the AIS system. AIS uh, is, a, is a very valuable tool for mariners. Um, but I, with the caveat that not all vessels carry AIS, but for those that do, it is a, 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 a key tool for navigation. So we, we do commit to the use of AIS. Uh, what we will be looking for from the FTWIG is input on, on to what extent that we use that AIS. That, that, will, be, that will be key um, because we've heard a lot of different, um, a lot of different ideas and, and, and thoughts on how extensively AIS should use. Do you use it on each platform? Do you put it on the boundaries? Do you put it on the corners? So those are the, the type of very um, practical conversations that we need to have at the EPSWIG level and, and others. Of course, uh, the Coast Guard needs to have a, a, a lot of input as well. But there's many, uh, many different ways that you can, you can aid to navigate uh, in an offshore wind farm. Uh, and those are, are a couple, but uh, they are key. And, and, and marking, obviously, uh, marking of the towers uh, and any other uh, structures associated uh, is also a big part. Uh, you can identify where you are in a wind farm by those markings. 
uh, and any other key information would be would be on those on those platforms and structures. Yeah, and sort of sort of aligned with that, um, we've heard a lot of folks. Well, not a lot. We've heard some folks express concern about uh, about radar clutter as it's associated with uh, with turbine arrays, and seen some maps of what or seen some images of what that radar clutter looks like. Um, have you guys been thinking about radar clutter, and and is that an issue? So we we do hear this a lot, uh, Greg. It's a, it's a it's a it's a common topic um, in the U.S. I'll I'll, I'll, would, I'll say that it's a, it's a common topic in the U.S. So while there there can be some radar concerns, and I will I, I will uh, be very open about that. I think those most of the times those those concerns are misconceptions. So what we see, you know, every day is that you are very very capable of using your radar. Uh, without interference in offshore wind farms, uh, not just offshore wind farms, but any any other steel structures in the water or land masses, and it comes down to several things. But you know, a, a gain adjustment, proper use of the radar. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different uh, you know factors when why people think radar might might be a a factor going forward. But we, uh, what I will say anecdotally is what we see is this is a non-issue uh, in European wind farms. I just came from a European wind farm with several members of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard, uh, a, a couple of members of Broda, and, and a, and a uh, U.S. Uh, maritime pilot, where you know we, we were up in the wheelhouse navigating through the wind farm and, and, and looking at the radar. That's very anecdotal. I realize that, um, but for for most of the captains and navigators in in other wind farms, this, this is a non-issue. Uh, it is something that we have to address. We have to look look at more closely. Uh, and make sure that we're listening, addressing concerns. One of the ways that we'll do that is through our navigation safety and risk assessment. Um, and we've already done uh, several radar studies that supplement those NSRAs. Thank you. Um, and another one that comes up a lot in conversations about uh, environmental disturbance is the is the, the transmission cable going back to shore. Mm -hmm and trying to install a cable such that you provide as little disturbance of the seabed as you can in the installation process while also assuring that that cable remains buried throughout the duration of the project. Can you talk a little bit about that and also whether you have an expectation of using a substation and where that substation might be located? Yeah, so I, I would say in terms of the OSS, we are very early in the in the project and, pro, you know, we're just just starting to kick off survey activities and um, and what the project will look like, the size of the project, the needs of OSSs. So we will certainly share that as that comes up, uh, and certainly share that not just at the Twig but but in other avenues. Uh, in terms of cable installation, there are many ways to to lay cable internationally. Um, there's several techniques. Uh, there is ways to lay cable with very minimal uh, disturbance of the bottom. Uh, there's simultaneous uh, lay and bury techniques. There's uh, there's ways to lay cable quicker and, and come back and bury it um, soon after. So all of those different methods of cable lay will will be looked at um, it, it, with minimal disturbance of the bottom and it's but also focusing on we we obviously want it to be quick. But keep in mind these cables are you know I, I, another misconception of cable lay is when we look at it on a chart, we look at a cable route, it doesn't fully represent the size of a cable. These cables are not that big. Uh, and, and I'm happy to, to, to bring one of these cables, uh, a, a slice of them into a, into a meeting uh, for anyone that's interested or share uh, technical details of those cables, but they aren't that big. Uh, and at the end of the day, it is very minimal disturbance to the bottom. All right, well, um... Again, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to submit them. But um, is there anything else that you want to add that you uh, you may have skipped over in your presentation, John, um, before we wrap up? I don't think so, Greg. I think I think that uh, that covers it. I, I recognize that we're early in the process. I look forward to uh, to continuing to all these very important discussions. Uh, I know that we're going to have in the future, uh, and I'm excited about about Sunrise Project. Uh, Greg, there was this is Pat. There's just one last uh, co question or comment that came in just just a minute ago. I was wanting to go look there and, and see if you want to just pose that to John before we close. Yeah, can so the the question is in regard to uh, turbine layout 
and and how are you engaging with the commercial fishing industry on designing your turbine layouts to maximize fishing access? Yeah, it's a great question. So obviously, layout is a is a hot topic, and uh, we are you know we we have made the commitment for all of our projects in the New England cluster that includes Sunrise uh, in that lease area to 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 have those layouts have the east west corridors that are a nautical mile uh, spacing. That being said, we are continuing uh, to have discussions on the dock. There's hundreds and hundreds of these discussions that happen uh, to get try to get input. It's not always successful, but we, we try to get that input. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of different opinions and, 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 and ideas. Um, and that's just one method. We also uh, will look forward to continuing to use ROTA as a, as a vehicle for these discussions. We will use the New York F twig um, as a as a, a vehicle for these discussions, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, the state the state working groups and and the councils and and anything else that's available to us. You know, I didn't obviously I didn't hit every single one off the top of my head, but there are many avenues for input into uh, into layout and design uh, moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, one other question that's come in is in regard to um, insurance. Do you know if insurance rates for fishermen are increasing in, in, in wind farms? Have you had a conversation about that with fishermen regarding insurance rates and accessing wind farms? I say that's, a, that, you know, I've heard that before, Greg. We, we heard that, uh, you know, back when, when I was with deep water, we did um, have fishermen look into it. Uh, and ask the question of their of their insurance companies, but you know insurance companies can't uh, you know it's a risk that they can't quantify. It's a it's a risk that doesn't exist right now. It's in the future. So to ask an insurance company, I think that's you know that's a very difficult difficult thing uh, to try to predict a potential risk that's in the future that doesn't exist now. That being yeah, said, no, you know, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, finish up. And that being said, so, you know, again, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we, we de-risk, uh, you know, the, the, the wind farm. So cable burial depth, layout, aids for navigation, all the things that we actually were just talking about for the past, uh, you know, 30 minutes or so, to make sure that, you know, the risk is, 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 is minimized as much as possible. As we go to these larger turbines, the spacing increases, like, so... And again, looking globally, these issues, these issues are not similar to what we're seeing globally. So I, I know we can work towards uh, making sure people are comfortable, but the insurance one, you know, it, we did reach out. It's, it's difficult to get an answer out of an insurance company, as you can imagine. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, th I think this might be one of those questions we can perhaps try to get at a little bit with our uh, fishing access project that's being led by NREL. Um, but I appreciate the feedback on that. Thank you for your time and uh, and for being uh, forthright in your answers. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to uh, wrap it up now, and uh, we'll be picking up again uh, with a with a conversation with Equinor about the Empire Wind Project at the top of the hour. But I appreciate you all participating. If you're looking for more information about what we do with the FTWIG and other roles of uh, of the state in this process. Feel free to uh, to check out the NYSERDA Offshore Wind webpage. That'll include links to the projects I discussed, as well as links to the uh, to the F Twig webpage. And uh, thank you all, and uh, hope to catch up with you soon. And just to close, if you are joining the next webinar for the other project, it is a different URL and a different phone number. So make sure you look on the invite for those different numbers to join uh, in just a little bit. Thank you all. <laughs>